Two other types of sampling devices I just want to mention here because it's a good place to do it. Uh, an awful lot of the focus here is the sampling on uh, of volatile organic compounds, the VOCs, TCE, PCE, the solvents. And so um, when you pump a well to sample it and you got to purge that water out I was telling you about, you end up with water that contains these contaminants and they're a hazardous waste in themselves so you can't just dump them on the ground. So you usually have to containerize them, bring them to a treatment plant and have them treated. So this is your purge water. So the objective is to try to come up with ways of sampling um, wells without having to pump water out of them. It's sort of passive sampling. Wouldn't it be nice if you could lower something down on those well screens, let it sit there for a while and then pull it out and not have to actually purge any water out. So folks have been coming up with things called diffusion devices. Let me step over here. This is an example of one of these. Uh, that's been sitting in this well since the last time I came and did a field trip probably in a year ago. <laughs> in fact, I opened up and I went, huh. <laughs> um, so what we've done is we've actually hung a sampling device. I'm going to ask someone to just hold on to that. It's a little, we'll see if I can't do this in some sort of a rational way. Um, we have a sampling device hanging on the bottom of this, I hope. Um, and um, the, the theory is this. Um, the well screen is down there. Here it is. It isn't all the way to the bottom. I was kind of worried there for a minute. Uh, it's just, it's a fake one. It's just hanging down there. This would normally be hanging down in the well screen. Okay. The idea being that the well screen is an open to the aquifer because the interior of the well is infinitely permeable compared to the aquifer. It's an open hole. Groundwater, if you look at Friesen Cherry, page 279, I think it is. <laughs> There's actually a diagram that shows that flow lines, at least in theory, would converge in a well, pass through the well, and go out. So the well would constantly be flushing itself out naturally because it's sort of an infinitely permeable piece of the aquifer right there. So it's like a lens. It would focus flow through itself. So, you'd, so in theory, the water in the screen always represents the water in the aquifer adjacent to the screen because it naturally purges itself. So what you do is you hang some sort of a diffusion device down there to be able to, to, to sample that water. And what this is, is just a polyethylene bag filled with distilled water. So it's organic free distilled water. It's just regular polyethylene sandwich bag stuff. Uh, we buy it in tubes, but it's a sandwich bag. And you fill it with DI water and you lower it down to the screen. This thing's bathed with the water going by that contains the solvents. And it turns out that polyethylene is permeable to solvents. That's why you don't sample it in plastic bottles. You sample it in glass bottles. So what happens is you, just by diffusion, you get, you know, Henry's law, you get diffusion of the solvents into here until it reaches equilibrium with the water on the outside. So if you leave it in there long enough, you can just pull this out and take this and sample it, and, th and you've sampled your well. You, have, you don't have to actually pump the well. Does that make sense? So it's a call a passive diffusion bag sampling, um, and uh, it's being uh, tested and it's actually being used at a number of places now for, for the long-term uh, monitoring program at, uh, again, just for solvents. Things like nitrate and phosphate won't go through this, but solvents will. And usually that's what they're stuck monitoring for is solvents uh, for these long-term programs. So that's all there is to that. This one's just, it isn't even in the screen, it's just a dummy one. One, one of the first rules of, uh, there's a device called the baler, which is basically a very narrow bucket that you could put down a well and take a sample with manually. One of the first rules is tie the end of the rope to your wrist yeah. <laughs> before you start to lower. The other thing too is, uh, the other thing too is that, um, all pens have a special homing device <laughs> and sharpies and pens that can go down a two inch hole from any distance if you bend over. <laughs> right? We've all, yeah. no! <laughs> We've all experienced that horror, haven't yeah. we? And there's another rule that uh, no, no matter how large a hazardous waste site you, or, or how small rather, a hazardous waste site you work on, it will be on the edge of two topographic maps. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> your topographic maps are this big and your site is that big, it's going to be right on the edge. Usually in the corner of four. I'm just going to tighten these up while I'm here. We don't have too much problems with vandalism, but we don't, we don't take our chances too much. Um, let me just check my hand out here and see if there was anything else I wanted to bring up. Oh, yeah, there is. Yeah. Uh, I, mentioned that these, uh, I mentioned that these diffusion samplers don't work for anything but the volatile organics, which will go through the plastic. Uh, and, of course, there's a great interest in could, could diffusion sampling be used for, could other types of membranes be useful for sampling, say, metals or things that won't go through polyethylene? And there's a number of folks experimenting with this right now. Uh, this is a... Um, uh, a, a, a pretty new type of diffusion sampler someone's come up with. This is porous polyethylene. It doesn't look very porous, 
but it's actually uh, made up of little beads of polyethylene that have been squished together. And it's actually the material, how many of you have a fish aquarium? Any of you have a fish aquarium and you have the little diffuser that bubbles, in, it's a little white tube like this sometimes. This is really, uh, it, it's just a porous polyethylene with large pores. And so um, what you do is you fill this with distilled water just like the other sampler. And of course you shut these little valves and you lower it down in your screen. And it turns out that even uh, inorganics will go through this metals and large, large organic molecules. And in particular, we're testing it right now looking for explosives compounds. We're, we have a, an experiment we're running up on the base where we're seeing if we can't, again, they have the problem of having to pump up this water and then having to treat it. Uh, and also, uh, anytime you start to bring pumps out, you have to have a truck and they're, they're hoping to get to the point where a guy with a backpack will have a bunch of these. He'll run out or she'll run out you know, pull out the old one, fill the bottles, put the new ones down and leave, and it could just be a person on foot doing sampling. So we're, we're experimenting to see whether we can do long-term monitoring of other compounds like, like uh, the uh, aromatic explosive compounds or perchlorate, you know, using these kinds of devices. So uh, that hasn't, uh, it, they work in the lab, but uh, everything has to be tried in the field. Yeah. Is there any way you could put a material in there that would act like a magnet for the crap? Um, the, actually, that, the whole idea comes from exactly that. Um, they've used, um, have you ever done this, Eric? But, you know, they, 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 uh, when they're looking for things like PCBs in rivers, they have these, um, I forget what they call them. Do you remember? Huh? What, where they put the little things on with the, with the, uh, the lipids and it, it's, it, it absorbs the... Uh, I don't remember the name of it. The, people have done this. They actually have a chamber filled with a particular material that absorbs a contaminant of interest. And they've done that a lot in streams, looking for PCBs so and stuff like that. Semi-permeable bags. Yeah, semi-permeable bags. Uh, or they have blocks of material that will eventually absorb the contaminants in. So um, is that a way you can actually clean up the uh, The quantities are just too tiny. Sampling. Yeah, it's more for sampling. I mean, no, the way they clean up the water is to run it through activated carbon. They have big, huge carbon vessels. They pump up the contaminated water and they run it through activated carbon and sorb out. So yeah, on that scale, but that's on the scale of, you know, massive buildings, not, not a well at a time. Okay? All right. Yeah. If the suction pump works so well, why do you go to the trouble of getting that really complicated pump that comes from Because the at the top of the hill, the suction pump won't work anymore. Hmm. How far can you lift water? 33 feet. 33 theoretically, yeah, right? Well, just also because it's hard to pull a perfect vacuum. Uh, you can lift water with a suction pump, uh, basically uh, at sea level here, about theoretically about 32 feet. Practically, most pumps have a hard time after about 29. Our peristaltic, we actually ran an experiment here one time. We got a big tall ladder and we, uh, we uh, took the peristaltic pump and we just walked up the ladder and we walked it up until it wouldn't pump anymore. And it was about 29, 29 feet. It just couldn't produce enough of a pull. Once you get beyond that, you're pulling a perfect vacuum, like a barometer. So then you need to put something down the hole and push the water out. You actually will vaporize the water. Yeah, the water will just boil. Yeah, but you can't get that perfect a vacuum. It's really hard to do. So, for example, we didn't do it today, but when you walk up on the hill, instead of multi-levels like that, you see clusters of 10 wells. And, and uh, there are devices that will go down smaller diameter multi-level samplers. We found that they're um, they're prone to being plugged by little pieces of grit. You know, in other words, they, they look great on paper, and they just never work for a very long time. So we just when we're when we're below suck when we're too deep to water to use a, a multi-level sampler, we just put in clusters of wells. You just live with that that limitation. One of the things to kind of get a feel for too is uh, as you watch all of this is how much planning gone into being able to do this efficiently. You know, there, there's an awful lot of detail required to do field work. And these folks are these folks are whizzes at it. I mean, they've, they've done it a lot and they've really worked out a routine, but um, field work requires a lot of careful work and a lot of attention to detail and, you know, things like bungee cords on, you know, spools so they don't run loose and all that kind of stuff. It just, um, it takes a lot of time to develop those techniques so that you can do this quickly and efficiently. We'll see a real good example of that in a minute. <laughs> Let's discover their contamination. Um, and then the uh, cleanup of the most of the plumes is, is a, it's, it's the military's version of Superfund. It, it does fall into the Superfund yeah, laws, it's super fun. but it's, not, it's, it's, um, it's the military's cleanup program. Um, and then uh, the impact area, 
the stuff with explosives and perchlorate is actually uh, different. That's under the Safe Drinking Water Act because it's considered a present activity. So it doesn't, Superfund's only clean up of old stuff, and that's considered a present day activity. So that's actually being regulated underneath the Clean Drinking Water Act. So there's multiple, and it's all DOD money, except for the USGS research money. It's all Department of Defense money. They think they're going to spend about one and a half billion before they're finished, which sounds like a lot, but in the scheme of things. 10% of a big dig. Yeah. yeah. Ten, one.